This is My Seminary Life, episode 10, where we will be discussing What Are We to Make of Jesus Christ by C.S. Lewis. Welcome back, everyone. Brandon Knight here, bringing you another exciting episode in our fake summer semester. Normally here on My Seminary Life, I sit down to recap you on what I've been studying in my seminary classes, giving you the the short version of what's going on. If you're brand, brand new to the show, I encourage you to go back. We have the entire first season up now on spiritual formation. It's a really, it's a really good journey. I think you'll enjoy it. But I don't have any classes to take this summer, so we this is all listener's choice for our fake summer semester to keep the party going. And right now we are starting things off with a conversation looking at different shorter writings by C.S. Lewis. Last week we studied God in the Dock, and I am very excited for this week's conversation as well. If you if you listened to last week's episode, you may have noticed that, uh, you may have gotten the impression that it was decided kind of last minute. We kind of figured it out last minute that I didn't have any classes to take this semester. And you would be correct if you if you got that tone from me telling that story. It was it was so close that I had the registrar's office telling me, Hey, don't buy any books yet. We're reviewing it today. We should have an answer by tomorrow. And I'm like, it starts on three days. What am I supposed to do here? But it got all figured out, which makes it so much more ironic that this week I got an email from the registrar's office informing me what I'm taking in the fall time. That's right, folks. I already know what my fall classes are going to be. So uh, a little bit of a uh, little bit of a tease here. Season three of the fall semester will begin the final week of August. So the week before, we'll probably take the week off. I'll drop a trailer to announce the topics for that season and just to give you a little bit of a little bit of a hint one of them one of our topics is going to be very intellectual and the second topic is going to be way practical so we're going to get kind of the best of both perspectives here very intellectual make you want to go out and do something it should be good i'm i'm very interested in the second class but more on that when we get to it. I'm just going to be up front right now and let you all know that uh, yesterday we went, my wife and I, we went and got our uh, first vaccine and we had COVID back in February. So we've heard that if you had COVID when the day after you get the vaccine, it's usually pretty rough. Right now she is out. She is out in bed, sleeping hard, and I feel as stiff as a doornail. So we'll see how this episode goes. It may be shorter. We'll find out. I'll find out by the end. You'll know. Uh, you'll know before you start the episode. He's, hey, look, this one only goes for ten minutes. What's up with this? It's because I'm trying not to fall asleep making the episode. Uh, so, but for now. Let's dive into today's main topic. We're going to be looking at uh, something Lewis wrote back in 1950, that is 1950, just in case you can't tell what I'm saying. This is, uh, what are we to make of Jesus Christ? Now, let's just dive right into this. I had originally planned on doing more than one writing this week, and that was kind of my goal originally was to maybe tackle two or three in each week. But after reading this, which this is like four pages long, and then sitting down and writing the script and putting in some of my own thoughts, I was like, wow, this is, I'm not going to be able to do multiple articles each week because we'll be here forever. (laughs) I like to keep these short. We're going to be here for like two hours if I do more than one. So We're just going to do this short one this week. We'll see how it goes. What are we to make of Jesus Christ? And Lewis starts this off 
talking about how this is actually a really comical question. That is the word he used. It's comical. This is a really funny question. And he compares it to a fly, you know, itty bitty, itty bitty fly, looking at a great big elephant and wondering what it's supposed to make of the elephant. It's, it's silly. It's, it's goofy. The question should be, what is Jesus to make of us? The question we are asking is, what are we to do with the written records that we have of the life and ministry, the teachings and the claims of Jesus Christ? That's really the question we are asking here is, what are we to do with the Gospels? What are we to do with this written record that we have in Scripture about Jesus Christ? And let me, let me uh, take a step back here and explain that this, what are we to make, this we that Lewis is talking about, I would say this we isn't so much Christians as it is unbelievers. You know, last week, uh, God in the Dock was talking about, you know, unbelievers, kind of the uh, obstacles that Christians have in sharing their faith with unbelievers. This week, the we, I think, really more so focuses on Christians before they were saved or unbelievers, like wrestling with this question of who is Jesus? What are we to make of these teachings that we have about him? And the reason I say that is because by by the end of this article, by the end of this writing, the the conclusion basically says if you're a christian you're going to accept this teaching that's that's basically the punchline don't worry it get, it's way more interesting than that but that's basically the punchline that what are you to make of these teachings well if you accept them that means you're a christian but if you don't that means you're not but let's flesh this out i'm kind of getting ahead of myself i just wanted to make that part clear that the we here is really people who are wrestling with Christianity with Jesus with scripture rather than believers already now when we ask this question what are we to make of the written record of Jesus and his teaching and ministry Lewis says that for all intents and purposes nobody really has a problem with the moralistic teachings of Jesus. If anything, that's the part that everybody likes and everybody still holds on to. Everyone's cool with good moral teachings. Everybody's cool if you want to, you know, go to the broader scope of scripture. Everyone's cool with the Ten Commandments to some degree, like thou shalt not murder. Got it. Sounds good. Don't don't bear false witness. Got it. Sounds good. And a lot of the teachings of Jesus that lie on the more moralistic side, just about everybody is cool with the golden rule. Just about everyone's cool with the idea of loving their neighbor. It may be difficult, but you know, people are cool with moralistic teachings. That's So that's not even really the question either. The question is not what are we to make of Jesus or what are we to make of his moralistic teachings. The question is, what are we to make of Jesus in light of these claims to deity? That is the question. Jesus claims to divinity, stating that before Abraham was, I am, is the problem. Jesus forgiving sins that were not committed against him personally, that's the problem. Jesus saying that when he is around, no one has to fast. That's the problem. These are the problems that people have with the written records of, of Jesus. It's these moments of claiming deity. That's the problem they ha he had when he was on earth then. That was the problem in 1950. And that's the problem that we still have here in 2021. What are we to make of the claims to deity written in the Gospels? by Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus Christ was just, you know, if Jesus was just another religious leader and he was teaching good moral things, no harm, no foul. You know, what's the big deal? He's he's just a rabbi giving his two cents on the best ways to live 
to glorify God. Okay, fine. In a in a uh, pluralist, I don't know, nah, pluralistic. I don't think it's the right word here. But in a world where we're all about coexist and bringing more and more religions together, and you know, trying to find the common ground throughout all the religions, Jesus just being a good moral teacher. That's fine. It's when he starts saying, I'm God, and the rules are different when I'm around, that's when things get a little sticky, both in 1950, back when Jesus was alive, and today as well. In this writing, Lewis takes a turn. This is when he's going to start building his argument. This is when he starts flushing his argument out. And it reminds me a lot of the part in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, also written by C.S. Lewis, where Peter and Susan go to the professor to talk to him about Lucy claiming to have gotten into Narnia, I think it was twice at this point, and Edmund had gotten in there with her, but he's just, he's lying and saying, oh no, no, we were just, you know, we were just play pretending, and so Peter and Susan, they don't know what to do with this, and so they're talking to the professor about it, and the professor says to some effect of, what do they teach you kids in school anymore? And he starts making a case for the use of logic, and he says, basically, you know, if if Lucy is the one who is typically truthful, and Edmund is the one that is typically a trickster, then you should know which one you should believe. You should believe Lucy that she got into a wardrobe and ended up in a magical land. Logic. What do they teach these kids nowadays? And that's basically where Lewis takes this conversation. There's, there's plenty of scripture involved in his argument. But basically, he tests this theory with logic. What are we to make of the claims to deity in the Gospels? And he's going to use logic, to the best of his degree, to wrestle with this question. At this turn, Lewis points out that it is this claim to divinity that separates Christianity from all other religions. If you sat down with the leading religious figure of almost any other religion and asked them, are you the head deity? The chances are that person would say no. Great example that Lewis brings up. If you went to Muhammad and asked, are you Allah? The answer would be absolutely no. If you went to Socrates and asked him if he was Zeus, the answer would be no. And that's the point that Lewis is getting here. Even in religions where they don't really have like a, like a head deity, but maybe it's a, you know, becoming one with the universe or something like that, or achieve, achieving nirvana or anything like that the head religious leader of that group is still going to say no. They're going to point you to something else. Whereas in Christianity, the author of our faith, Jesus Christ, he's going to say, yes, I am God. And that's what separates Christianity from everything else. And that's what makes it so difficult, I think, for other people. I think that's what makes it difficult for the Pharisees in Jesus' time, for unbelievers in 1950, and for people nowadays who are trying to bring religions more and more together under one big coexist umbrella, is that Christianity is different. Our religious leader is God. Jesus is God. At this point, uh, similar to the conversation from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we either have to take Jesus at his word, much like how Peter and Susan were encouraged to take Lucy at her word, or, as Lewis puts it, we need to consider the fact that Jesus, and these are his words, was more insane than Adolf Hitler. That's what Lewis That's the perspective that Lewis puts on this. Either Jesus is absolutely telling the truth that he is God, 
or he is more out of his mind than the one man that most of the world can agree on was way, way, way out of his mind. That's insane. That is the stark contrast that Lewis paints here. Either Jesus is absolutely telling the truth, or he is way out of it. He is insane in the membrane. From there, Lewis begins to address a series of arguments that people could raise about what has been recorded about Jesus. Basically, there's a series of arguments that are brought up to try and explain away what the Gospels are saying about Jesus. These other perspectives, I don't know if these were perspectives, he doesn't write here if these were uh, arguments that people literally brought to him. One of them, he does say he heard someone say this, and he's giving a rebuttal to this one thing. We'll talk about that here in a couple minutes. But these first couple of, this first argument, he doesn't say if anyone has said this before, if he's read it before. So I don't know if he's just offering up something. I'm assuming that he has heard all of these arguments before raised by different people. And the first argument that comes up is that the gospel accounts are exaggerated, making them more legends than biographies. The text of the gospel accounts, what the gospel writers wrote about Jesus in this first argument are exaggerated. They're exaggerated. Jesus didn't really make a claim to divinity. The authors of the Gospels, they exaggerated exactly what Jesus was saying. So anytime that he makes a claim to deity, it, 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 he really didn't. The authors were exaggerating to try and, you know, write a legend about a, a religious leader rather than a biography. And Lewis has two rebuttals to this first argument, that the Gospels are exaggerated. The first one, the first rebuttal, is that Jewish men would not create a legend about meeting the Son of God. Jewish men would not do that. And the emphasis there isn't so much on the men part, but the, the ethnicity, the Jewish part. Because... In Judaism, God is one. Christianity, Christians believe in a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three distinct parts in one God. In Judaism, God is one, the end. Yahweh is one. And for a bunch of Jewish men to write legends about a Jewish man, a rabbi, a religious leader, and exaggerate the details to make it sound like they had somehow had an encounter with the Son of God is a little illogical in Lewis's perspective. It's illogical. He says that this would be the least likely group on the entire earth to accidentally create a legend about meeting the Son of God. This is the last group on earth that you would ever run into to do something either accidentally or intentionally like this, that they had somehow met the Son of God himself. Illogical. The second rebuttal, if the Gospels are legends, so let's just keep assuming that the Gospels are exaggerations, they are legends. If the Gospels are legends, then in Lewis, in Lewis's perspective, the literary scholar, they're terrible. They're terrible legends if that's what they really are. They're horribly written. If that was the goal of the authors of the Gospels, was to write a legend about a religious leader, then they're, they're poorly written. He says that he's read so many. He has read so many legends. And the Gospels do not read 
like a proper legend. They do not read like how a legend should. He points out that the Gospels are not artistic enough, is the words that he uses, to be legends. And he points specifically to a story in the Gospel of John where a woman who is caught in adultery is brought before Jesus and the Pharisees want to stone her. But Jesus says, you know, whoever is without sin casts the first stone and they all leave because no one is perfect. And then Jesus forgives her. Well, twice in this story, John writes that Jesus wrote in the dirt. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Christianity and the teachings of, the, of Scripture, nobody knows what Jesus wrote in the dirt. It does not say in the Bible what it what he wrote. It just says Jesus wrote in the dirt. <clears throat> All throughout church history, there has been theories on what Jesus wrote, but that's all that it is. Theories and speculation. No one knows. And Lewis comments on this that if this was a proper legend, we would know what he wrote. It would be significant to the story. It would come back up later. It would be it would be something that it would be a literary device that the author was using to help move the story along. Rather, we don't know, which he concludes means that John just wrote it down because he remembered it happening. He doesn't remember what Jesus wrote, but he remembers, oh yeah, Jesus wrote something in the dirt. Because he was there when it happened. So it's not legend. Eh. So it's not legend, but the other argument that Lewis has come across <clears throat> is that the death and resurrection of Jesus is actually about the preservation of an individual's personality after they have passed. In other words, the purpose of the cross and the resurrection is to show how someone's legacy can live on after them. That, that is what eternal life is, is that, you know, you create a legacy that goes beyond you, which does sound very literary. That does sound like it would fall back under this legends category of, this is the point of the story, is that you can create a legacy for yourself that lives on after you. <clears throat> However, that's not what it seems that the gospel writers are saying in their Gospels. The Gospel writers are saying that there is something new being ushered into the world through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The forbidden door had been forced open. Jesus conquered death. Lewis writes that this is more than mere ghost survival. That's the term that he uses, ghost survival, which based off of the context of how he uses this phrase, it seems that this ghost survival means that the accounts after the resurrection of Jesus, when the, the disciples encounter Jesus, they aren't encountering a ghost. It's not like they're running into the ghost of Jesus, which apparently would have been an option because... The one time when they see Jesus walking on the water, that is what some of them react to initially is, oh, hey, there's a ghost walking. And that's when he was still alive before the rest or before the cross. But after the death and resurrection of Jesus, all the times that the disciples encountered him, it's more than just ghost stories. It's more than just we had an encounter with the ghost of Jesus. He was a, literally in physically there. Something new had been ushered in. Jesus is not presented as a ghost or a corpse whose legacy is living on, but a new mode of being, that is a direct quote from Lewis, has been introduced. What are we to make of that? What are we to make of the new being that has been brought? into our world. Do we accept, the question now is, do we accept the 
Christian hypothesis. That is what Lewis writes here. The Christian hypothesis, which says God has descended down into manhood and is now pulling humanity back up towards himself. That is the Christian hypothesis. The counter hypothesis to this is not legends, exaggeration, or ghost stories. It's not those three rebuttals. But Lewis says that the alternative hypothesis is lunacy or lies. Either it's all true or it's all a lie. And I echo the words of Lewis here when he says, unless we take the second hypothesis, which I do not, one must turn to the Christian hypothesis. In Lewis's mind, it's all or nothing, which I think is how the Gospels portray it as well. It's all or nothing. It's not this, I'm going to take some of the teachings of Jesus. I'm going to see him as a good teacher and take his moralistic teachings. It's either he is the son of God, he did rise from the dead, or lunacy and madness and lies. That is the real options. The question is not what are we to make of Christ, but what he intends to make of us. Either we reject or accept the story. Lewis says that other religious leaders say, this is the truth in the universe. While Jesus says in our verse of the week, let me get my Bible up here. I should know this, but you know, I'll probably somehow mess it up if I don't read it. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Other religious leaders will say, over here is the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the way. And Lewis comments on the second half of that verse that no man can reach absolute reality except through Jesus. Because isn't that where this is all headed? One day... As believers, we are going to be united with Christ, the bride and the bridegroom brought together. We will have glorified, resurrected bodies, and we will be living in a place where we will be living here on earth with creation fully redeemed. Because right now, all of creation is growing for, groaning for that final redemption. And I don't know about you, but it seems like this past year has really shown how much we are groaning for that final redemption. As we have seen time and time again to varying degrees, hate, selfishness, destruction to varying degrees by us humans. That's what it's been, time and time again, all throughout history, obviously. But it's been so, so obvious this past year. We need a Savior, and we long for that final redemption. We are promised in Scripture that one day as believers, we will, be, we will receive those glorified bodies, and we will be in a created world fully redeemed back to the garden state by the father absolute reality with god and that is the conclusion of what are we to make of jesus christ but what do you think what do you think of all this do you think that lewis's argument is well thought out do you like his use of logic or would you rather him stick to more scriptural text. There is a preferred method when it comes to apologetics that you just use scripture or you can use other uh, faculties to kind of round out your argument. So what do you think? What do you think of this writing? You can let me know on 
social media where you, you can comment wherever you found the link to this episode. You can follow me on Twitter at my underscore seminary life. Or you can head on over to our profile on Anchor where you can leave a voice message for me to tell me what you tell me what you think of Lewis's writings today. Also, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate it if you subscribe, favorited, star reviewed, whatever it is on whatever platform that you are streaming this from. And please, please continue to let people know about the show that you think would really get some enjoyment out of it. I mean, we're talking about C.S. Lewis. Everybody wants to talk about C.S. Lewis. Okay, probably not. There's got to be that one person out there who thinks that C.S. Lewis isn't a Christian or, like, doesn't like his writings. Actually, I do know someone who doesn't like the Chronicles of Nardia. I just thought of that right now. Anyway, anyway, off track. But in general, most people want to listen to uh, listen to C.S. Lewis and his writings. So let people know about the show. We are growing. Let me tell you, it's exciting. The numbers aren't ginormous, but it's always encouraging to me when I see these numbers and our projected audience size go up little by little, week by week. I It really makes me happy that people are interested in what's going on here. And maybe someday we'll have that Patreon where we can you know, unlock more podcast episodes or a, a store where you can get a sticker of the logo or a t-shirt with my face on it. Because that's the American dream right there, is it not, friends? A t-shirt with your face on it. Anyway, thanks again for listening. I appreciate all of you coming out week by week to hear me ramble for 30 minutes on something from the Bible. I really appreciate it. Please come back next week where we're going to be talking about C.S. Lewis's view on miracles. But until next time, catch you later.